Hi guys, this is Shalini and I am back to you with another video and today I am going to talk to you about Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common disorders or diseases that you see in older adults and it is first among the neurodegenerative disorders. So if you like today's video and the content, kindly like, share and subscribe and also let me know your valuable comments in the comment box. Alzheimer's disease. So it is a neurodegenerative disorder that leads to progressive disturbances of cognitive functions. And these cognitive functions are memory, judgment, decision making, awareness of physical surrounding and language. So Alzheimer's disease is basically slow in nature, progressive in nature and it affects most of the cognitive functions as I have described here. Now this picture is of Dr. Louis Alzheimer, a German physician who is credited to be the first to describe Alzheimer's disease. So he was the first person to find or to describe this disease. And this is Mrs. Auguste Ditter, a German woman, the first woman to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Now a little bit about the story of Mrs. Auguste Ditter. Her maiden name is unknown. She married Karl Ditter in 1880s and they together had one daughter. During the late 1890s is when she had started showing symptoms of dementia. She had loss of memory, delusions and even temporary vegetative states. She would have trouble sleeping, drag sheets across the house and scream for hours in the middle of the night. As a railway worker, Carl was unable to provide adequate care for his wife. He had admitted her to a mental asylum, the institution for the mentally ill and for the epileptics, Ironschloss in Frankfurt, and this was in Germany on 25th November 1905. There she was examined by this particular doctor called as Dr. Alois Alzheimer. Dr. Alzheimer asked her many questions and later asked her again to see if she remembered anything. He told her a couple of times to write her name. She tried to but would forget and would repeat saying Ich habe mich verloren which is in German because she was a German woman which in English means I have lost myself. After many years she became completely demented muttering to herself and she died on 8th April. 1906. More than a century later, her case was re-examined with modern medical technologies. Alzheimer concluded that she had no sense of time or place. She could barely remember details of her life and frequently gave answers that had nothing to do with their questions and were incoherent. Her moods changed rapidly between anxiety, mistrust, withdrawal and vininess. She seemed to be consciously aware of her helplessness and Alzheimer called it the disease of forgetfulness. So this is the history of Alzheimer's disease. So Mrs. Auguste Ditter was the first person who was diagnosed with this particular disease. Now we will see a little more about this disease. Etiology. There are many risk factors as you know for any, but any diseases, for this particular disease also there are few risk factors that I have categorized. One is advanced aging. Second thing can be environmental factors or any stress factors. Third is toxins. Fourth is if the particular person has got a family history where someone in the family has already got this disease. And fifth of course is because of some genetic mutations. So this is again a picture of a brain where you see normal neurons without any plaques or tangles. Here you see Another affected brain with a picture of a neuron where you have where you see plaques and tangles. So these amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are mostly associated with Alzheimer's disease, which we will see in the sections to come. Here in this picture, you see a healthy brain, you see a mild Alzheimer's disease brain, which is mildly sunken, and then you see a severely affected Alzheimer's disease brain. So I have already told you this is a disease of neurofibrillary tangles and also amyloid plaques. So in the slides to come we will see one by one. 
these are amyloid precursor protein which later uh, is formed into beta amyloid this beta amyloid when aggregates itself is called as plaques so we'll see how this happens so there are three enzymes one is alpha secretase enzyme second is beta secretase enzyme and third is gamma secretase enzyme when these enzymes will cut the amyloid precursor protein at correct levels or when it cleaves it at the appropriate levels the remnant is soluble in nature but when it doesn't do or when it doesn't cut or cleave the uh, amyloid precursor protein at the appropriate levels then it is not soluble in nature and it will start aggregating and will form plaques so let's look into the details of this picture so in this picture the alpha pre uh, the amyloid precursor protein is being cut by the alpha secretase enzyme at this level and then the gamma secretase enzyme will also cleave it again so this is a normal stage without formation of the plug in this stage what happens is the amyloid precursor protein is cut by the beta secretase enzyme and instead of being uh, cleaved here or being cut here it is cut at a upper segment so what happens the remnant again by the uh, gamma secretase enzyme is cut at a lower portion so this beta amyloid is formed and it forms plaque so this is what happens in case of a alzheimer's infected patient so this picture gives you a view of the plaque these are the neurons and there is a plaque sitting in between so what will the plaque do it will inhibit or disrupt the signals between these two neurons so that is the plaque that is formed now we'll look about neurofibrillary tangles so what happens so again this is a neuron you have microtubules so a picture of the microtubule is given here you see these are tau proteins so these clips that you see these are tau proteins so if you look at this these these microtubule are like beads these beads are held together in position because of these clips these clips are called as tau proteins now like let, let's look at the next picture okay so these tau protein stabilizes the microtubule so these are clips that will stabilize these beads together but what happens in alzheimer's disease there is loss of tau protein which will lead to dissociation of the microtubule so these microtubule will dissociate when there is loss of these tau proteins how is it lost so as you see here these are the tau proteins so these yellow color uh, beads these are the tau proteins and this is held in place because of phosphate groups so these red color buttons are these phosphate groups which when increased in number for example these are hypophosphorylated that means there is a phosphorylation at multiple sites which is more than usual so at this time what will happen these tau protein will destabilize this will wear off and when this will wear off the microtubule also will dissociate and the tau protein along with the hypophosphorylated groups it will together form the neurofibrillary tangles now look at this picture which is a comprehensive view these are the neurofibrillary tangles and these are beta amyloid plaques so this is a healthy neuron which doesn't have a plaque around which doesn't have a neurofibrillary tangle inside it so internally they will have tangles and externally they'll have plaques so this is the in case of a alzheimer's affected patient so what is the what are the clinical manifestation and i have categorized it into various stages in stage 1 so for a person who is affected with alzheimer's disease will have a survival up to 10 to 15 years but in those 10 to 15 years the spectrum of clinical manifestation or the way in which they present to you will be different so in the first 2 to 4 years they'll have confusion and forgetfulness they'll have loss of memory they'll be mood changes they'll not be oriented to time and place but in the next 2 to 10 years what will be have there'll be significant decrease in the amount of memory they'll have hallucination they'll not be able to concentrate on a particular thing they'll wander that means they'll just suddenly get out of the house and just start wandering around have restlessness muscle spasm and be have inability to perform uh, any functions which is logic in nature in the later stage of life that is in the last 1 to 3 years after 10 years what will happen is they will fail to recognize their own family members and there is a progressive inability to recognize their own mirror image 
there will be weight loss, there will be incontinence, swallowing difficulty and in the progression of disease they will even develop skin infections and seizures and things like that. So these are the clinical manifestation which we, you will see on the progress of a on the progress in case of a Alzheimer's disease. So diagnosis is basically done with the help of spec scan which is single photon emission computer tomography which is done at an early stage to diagnose the disease. Also EEG will tell you about diffuse slowing of the waves. So I have told you like plaques and tangles will block the passage of waves. So EEG is helpful to diagnose it at a later stage. MRI is also done which will tell you about the cortical atrophy in the later stage. Laboratory tests are also done to rule out infections and metabolic disorders because there would be some infections or certain metabolic disorders which can also cause disorientation uh, in individuals. So to rule out all that you can perform laboratory tests to ensure that there is no other electrolyte imbalance, there is no other metabolic disorders. Medical management. So before I move on to medical management, I would like to explain to you one more thing. So this is again a normal uh, axon and neuron. So what you see here is these vesicles have something called as acetylcholine. So at the neuromuscular junction, these acetylcholine is released and these are the receptor sites. This is acetylcholine esterase enzyme. Now why I am telling you this is because this acetylcholine is basically responsible for muscle contraction. It will help for dilation of blood vessels or increase salivation or decrease heart rate. All of this is why uh, is the function of the acetylcholine. So this is very important for muscular activity. But in recent times it is also seen that acetylcholine helps in learning and processing of memory. So concentration of acetylcholine is really important for the brain. Now when it is released the excess acetylcholine what happens it is being destroyed or decomposed by acetylcholine esterase enzyme because if there is excess of acetylcholine again it can lead to muscle cramps or fasciculations or things like that. So the excess is being decomposed by this acetylcholine esterase enzyme. Now in case of Alzheimer's disease there is less of acetylcholine that is released. If this less acetylcholine is decomposed by the acetylcholine esterase enzyme that means then it will lead to further dementia or demen the amount of memory or uh, disorientation will be increased in such persons. So that is why you will have to concentrate on drugs which will inhibit this enzyme that is acetylcholine esterase enzyme. So what we give them is Cholinesterase inhibitors, we give them donepezil, we give them rivastigmine, we give them galantamine. So these drugs will help to inhibit the acetylcholinesterase enzyme which will destroy the acetylcholine that is coming. So in these patients basically there is no cure. What you see them, the issue with these patients is they have low acetylcholine and high glutamate. So what you can do is to symptomatically cure these patients and do something which can increase the amount of acetylcholine and decrease the amount of glutamate. So to decrease the amount of glutamate we give them memantin which is N-methyl D aspartate antagonist. So this what does it do? It controls the action of glutamate which is again a key excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. So these are the two drugs that you can give actually but then on the process of the disease you see that there is no cure. Only thing is you can uh, arrest the progression of the disease or as arrest the uh, person going into complications. Management of behavioral symptoms, so if the uh, infected individual is aggressive, has got aggressive behavior or has got psychotic symptoms you see or as has some episodes of depression, then you will have to think of these drugs that is trisaclic antidepressants which is amitriptyline and imipramine. We can give them selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors which an example is fluoxetin. You can give them highly uh, anti-psychotics uh, in case of aggressive behavior like Haloperidol and Risperidon. Now coming on to the non-pharmacological interventions. As part of non-pharmacological interventions, you can think of behavior therapy where you try to engage the individual into certain activities. You can think of music therapy, massage and touch and physical exercise. So all of this will help the individual and also reminiscence therapy which is a form of counseling where you try to support the individual with the life histories of positive histories or biographies or of some other people, life histories of some other people. So these are certain treatment measures that you can think of in Alzheimer's disease. So thank you. I hope that today's video was useful for all of you. So if you have any doubts 
comments or clarification please let me know as well and also your topics of interest otherwise thank you once again and have a great day